Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Lunch with Forages uh, today. We uh, uh, have a, a really good program <laughs> coming up. Uh, uh, the, uh, our guest, John Wick from California, uh, who's done a lot with uh, carbon sequestration and, and compost. And uh, our host, Kathy both from Arizona, who is also the publisher of the online website On Pasture. And we'll turn that over to them shortly. Uh, we got a few housekeeping details. Details. I'm Woody Lane. I am uh, a person behind the scenes along with Angela Miles. Uh, we're from the Oregon Forage and Grasslands Council. This is being brought to you by the Oregon Forage and Grassland Council. Uh, and we are a volunteer organization here in Oregon although there, we have members from Washington, California, and across the country, including uh, outside New Zealand as well. So anyone can join the, our organization. Uh, and we focus, of course, on forages and all aspects of it, everything from hay to grazing to nutrition to whatever. Um, this, is, this session is our number six sex session from the fall series. Uh, this is the last session of this fall. Uh, our, our next session is going to be, when we have next sessions, it will be sometime in, you know, in the middle of the winter. Uh, so uh, you stay tuned for those and watch the website and uh, you, uh, to see what's going to be coming up. Um, our timing, the way we run this is that we, uh, we do from now for an hour, it will be uh, 60 minutes of lunch with forages where there's a com uh, conversation between the host and the guest uh, and they'll show things of that nature. Then we will switch at one at one o'clock Pacific time, we will switch uh, segue into the part of the of the whole session called at the bar, which is an open discussion and you'll be asked to put your mics on and raise your hand and, and there'll be a general discussion with everyone who's on. So you'll see how that works. What we do like you to do is rename yourself if you can. Uh, you'll see uh, uh, upper right hand corner of your little square, you'll click on those three dots, you'll see the word rename. And if you click on that, you can change your name. Well, what we want you to do is add your state or country to your name so that when people see all these boxes, they see where we could see where, where people are coming from, which is really cool, as opposed to just seeing a black name, uh, a black box. Uh, this uh, Lunch with Forages is being recorded. And those recordings are, will be uh, are available online to members of the organization. So when you become a member, uh, then you, you are able to 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 uh, uh, see these things. There's a, there's forty different all of them. There's forty recordings up there at this point. Um, Please uh, think about joining Oregon Forage and Grassland Council. Uh, when you become a member, you see the recordings. You also get uh, complimentary uh, subscriptions to uh, Progressive Forage and Hay and Forage Grower, two good magazines. Uh, Membership is only $35, and you can go to our website. Uh, Angela will put the, the URL up there, how to, how, to, how to join, and you become a member. And if you join now, of course, this is December, you're good through the end of 2023. Um, uh, those of you who are collecting, uh, who are mer members of the American Forage and Grasslands Council, uh, who are certified forage and grassland professionals, um, you can get one CEU, uh, continuing education unit for this session, for attending this session. And all we ask you to do if you're attending and need these CEUs is at the end of the session, just put your name in the chat. So that acts as a, a basically an attendance record that you were here. And that's what, and, and we'll do that. So with enough, enough uh, housekeeping details, we'll turn it over to Kathy and John and uh, go ahead, all yours. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Kathy Both. I currently live in Tucson, Arizona. And um, as Woody mentioned, I'm the publisher of an online grazing magazine called On Pasture. I met John Wick and his wife, Peggy Rathman, about almost 20 years ago now. Um, they invited me there to their ranch in California to help them teach some cows to eat weeds because they had a weed management issue. And so I went there and helped with that. And basically, since then, I have watched them do really amazing things. Uh, really involved in how to use agriculture for um, basically 
climate change problems, a climate change solution. And they've done some incredible work and made a discovery, I think, that is so simple that it seems like it couldn't possibly be, but it is. Uh, and that is spreading compost as a way to increase carbon sequestration in the soil. And he's actually found, as you'll hear today, that you can actually cool the planet um, that way. So um, just as a just to get you started with how this pot works and that it can work anywhere, here in Tucson, our um, we have uh, let's see, in the summertime, our temperatures run from about 105 to 115, and we get about 10 inches, it used to be 11 inches, but now we get only 10 inches of rain um, every year. That's all of our precipitation here in Arizona, in our particular area. Um, and what we, we have this backyard where we've been trying to grow things and nothing grows. And they tell us, oh, you know, plant the native vegetation that really likes the natives, the soil that we have here. And so we would plant it, everything died. So um, one day I was thinking about John and all of his work and I decided, you know, this compost thing, let's just try it. So my husband and I, we went and got some local compost. We spread it everywhere and not thick, just a thin layer, just spread it out. And then we waited. And I can tell you now that our vegetation has doubled. We've got 50% more vegetation than we ever had. Things have begun to grow. Native vegetation has appeared where we never had vegetation before. One of the really interesting things is that <clears throat> um, I think we're about three years into it. We can actually see the change in the soil. Before it was all just one color, just kind of imagine a pinkish red dirt. It wasn't soil, it was just dirt. And now we can see the color changing, it's getting darker. We can actually see a structure in the soil that did not exist before. And structure, as you know, is really critical for my, uh, the microbes and soil health and all those things, water holding potential and all those kinds of things. So I can tell you that this works. I can't tell you for sure that my, my little patch of backyard has become a carbon sink. I'm hoping that it's no longer a carbon source, which is what the entire Sonoran Desert is. So um, that's really all I've got to say. I'm going to turn it over to John now and let him kind of introduce himself. And he's got a really great presentation for you. And I'm really excited to hear from him. So John, would you like to take it away? Yeah, please. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm not sure. Is there something I'm supposed to do on the control or just sit here and talk? Um, you can, if you want, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. And then we can, you can start your the PowerPoint. Oh, and to everyone, I also wanted to add that there is a chat box. And if you would like, if you, if as John is explaining everything, there is, you have some kind of clarifying question that you'd like to ask, please note that it's a clarifying question. Otherwise, all of your questions will be saved towards the end. And I also have a whole list of um, a, a page of resources that I put together that follow up with John's information. And I'm going to put that link in the chat so that you will be able to, to find it later. So, all right, John, carry thank on. You. So hello, everyone. And thank you for uh, sharing your time with us today. I've, I've got some uh, personal experience that I want to share with you and um, really encourage you to stop. If you have a question, if you need something clarified, please uh, just say that and, and we'll pause and, and discuss your question. It's important. Um, I wanted to start with a little background. That, that earlier picture and this picture are, are views from our ranch. This is the reservoir next door. And this is actually um, a major source of water for our county. I'm in Marin County, California, north of San Francisco. And in the 1950s, the county recognized we needed water more than milk. And so five dairies were condemned. And um, my machine seems to be rotating through these. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm out of control here already. But in any event, this, this location here this island was where the barn and the milking parlor and the home was for the dairy that my wife and I 
uh, purchased in 1998 and began uh, taken care of. When we bought the property, it was actually to um, purchase a barn so we could put in the studio for my wife, who is a children's picture book author and illustrator. And we were not interested in the, the ranch, the 540 acre ranch surrounding the barn. We were focused on our work, which is children's books. And we evicted the young man who was leasing the grazing rights to our ranch. And within a few years, our beautiful green grass hills started to become a brush covered dachi mess, weeds and dead grass and out of control coyote bush. We had a problem. And so we um, started doing some research and we met a PhD rangeland ecologist, Dr. Jeffrey Creek. And he was the one who first came into our ranch and said, well, you might have something good. There, there looks like some native plants. Most of our ranch was covered with these oats, which came with the Spanish and dominate the system. And that's typical of our region. However, there were some deeper rooted native perennials. And Dr. Creek was excited about this potential of ours to promote the deeper rooted native perennials. So he suggested we introduce grazing, reintroduce it. We didn't own animals. So we ended up borrowing a very large herd. It took four sets of these doubles to bring the herd on. We did it after the cliff swallows arrived who eat the flies. And um, my slideshow is kind of running on its own right now. I want to slow it down. You, you may be seeing me bounce it back and forth, but, but basically we brought on the herd um, after having done a very extensive savory braced, savory based rather uh, holistic management strategy. We broke our ranch into 85 distinct breaks and then moved this large mob through the system, um, changing fields often, two hours, eight hours, one day, depending on the field size. And by doing this, we were actually able to witness, this was the day I removed them, this is a week later. That's the recovery that we were able to measure. So in one week, we were able to show that our grass recovered three quarters of an inch after the cows were gone. Had they been allowed to stay in that system, they would have continued to eat that grass shorter and shorter and shorter. So this strategy of ours to introduce a major grazing disruption was intended to create the deeper rooted native plant population and potentially ground nesting bird habitat. And it worked. This is a whole field, a whole ecosystem now of native plants and we never planted a seed. So these plants were in the system and by moving this wave of cows across the landscape, we were starting, starting to see a whole landscape level change that was really exciting to us. And so as we moved through the ranch, eating down our grass, managing, at the end of that, it, I think of the first year in 2005 was about two months, we actually needed a fifth trailer to haul away the additional weight, the same number of animals now weighed 50,000 pounds more than when they arrived. And the deal is that those animals ate grass that didn't exist six months before that. And Jeff Creek was getting more and more interested in our results. This was a large scale experiment. And he was describing what was happening here as photosynthesis and that we should think, think of our grass plants as little straws that sip carbon from the air. Now, this is interesting because plants and only plants can make sugar from CO2 from the atmosphere. And the um, work that Jeff had been doing on other projects was to be measuring soil organic matter, 50% of which is carbon, all of which came from the air. And Jeff was getting excited because he was thinking that these deeper rooted native perennials were sequestering significant amounts of carbon. In California at that time, there was a new law, AB 32, which had been signed into, into law. And there was a discussion about cap and dividend, cap and trade, cap and something. Now, now moving these animals through this landscape that um, much is hard work. Nobody would do this. We were, we were experimenting and willing to, to learn things but no one else would do this kind of hard work for the low returns. 
And we thought maybe if we could create a carbon credit or a carbon something, we could actually create revenue streams for ranchers to do this additional hard work that also was a climate benefit, but possibly. What we needed was a way to measure it. So we contacted UC Berkeley and Dr. Wendy Silver, a biogeochemist, came onto our ranch. And with her, we were going to try and develop evidence that we were in fact sequestering carbon. Her, her comment was that she actually doubted we were sequestering carbon and doubted that we would be able to measure it. There's so much carbon in soil that her thought was any changes that we had inspired through our grazing management probably would not be measurable. However, Jeff Creek on other projects had been measuring soil organic matter increases from one up to 12% by grazing management and compost application. So now I have two scientists who actually disagree. And this is interesting now, scientifically. And so what we decided to do was um, understand a little bit more. So Dr. Silver was ger very generous in her education at this time. She's a professor and measuring bulk soil carbon does not tell the whole story. This is the beginning of my education at this point. It turns out that the carbon in the soil can actually be broken down into fractions. There, you can think of them as different buckets and the different forms that carbon takes in the soil and how it, um, the form it's in determines how long it resides or residency time in the soil. Most soil carbon lasts very short. It's uh, minutes to months, it, it's temporary. However, some soil carbon can last for decades and some soil carbon can be considered permanent for our purposes. So most soil carbon is actually in the body of plants and microorganisms. It's called the labile fraction. Everything in the soil system is hungry and looking for food. Carbon is food and everything's eating this carbon that's in the labile fraction and it respires back to the atmosphere as CO2. However, in those systems, as a matter of circumstance, some of that carbon, which came through photosynthesis into the plants through the tissues, some of that carbon can end up in a physically protected form that can last for decades and when that happens, it changes the electrical properties of the soil. And now that soil holds more water in a detained form, particles of water in suspension around roots. And also there's another form of carbon, heavy fraction. This could be a, a type of carbon where it's a dead microbe or it's waste product has become chemically bonded inside a micro fissure within a clay particle. So these three forms of carbon, labile, occluded light fraction and heavy fraction carbon, are throughout the soil system. They can occur at the surface or down to a meter deep or as far down as roots go. And again, Dr. Silver did not think that our grazing management was increasing either of the two more durable forms. And so just to remind everyone, and this is something I knew, is that green plants produce oxygen and moisture to the atmosphere. They do this during photosynthesis by opening these stomata, these microscopic holes, releasing oxygen and moisture to the atmosphere. But what I never realized and didn't know until this project was at that same moment when the stomata open, atmospheric CO2, which is a gas under pressure, distributing itself out evenly across the Earth's atmosphere, this CO2 under pressure enters this open stomata. And then under the sun's energy, the plant actually combines soil moisture, as well as the waste product of microbes, nutrients, and minerals. So plants now, with the sun's energy, convert atmospheric CO2, soil moisture, into sugars or carbohydrates. I had never realized that all of the carbon and carbohydrates comes from the air. I would have said that it basically comes in through the soil. It's the opposite of that. Carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis becomes root tissues, carbohydrate root tissues, uh, cellulose, and plants also distribute sugar out through the roots to feed the microbes around the root zone that act as the digestive system and immune system for plants. And plants also support a, a relationship with mycorrhizal fungi where they exchange sugar for nutrients and um, then the fourth 
way that atmospheric carbon can be part of a soil system is through the natural accumulation of surface litter. This is dead tissue, dead plants, dead animals, manures, and different soil systems have developed different ways for that surface litter to become integrated into the soil as carbon in the three different forms. What's interesting is when we started looking at grass plants and, and the variety of root systems and different strategies each of the plants have, we started to appreciate that the, the promotion of a diverse ecosystem rather than a single species, which our ranch would, had currently been was mostly oats and some weeds, by promoting the conditions for a variety of plants, we, we might be able to uh, encourage more and more and more photosynthesis and photosynthetically derived carbon sequestration. So our ranch, this is this is basically our ranch here in California, is mostly grassland. There's brush, there's forest, and it turns out in California there are 23 million hectares, which is two and a half acres of rangelands. So that grass brush forest system can be called rangeland. California rangelands are 61% of them are Mediterranean, which describes when in the year the rain falls, not how much there is. And so as we're now working with Dr. Silver, we were looking at the potential of that system, if in fact we were sequestering carbon to be climate beneficial. She didn't think it would, but she was curious. So she looked to the literature. Dr. Rich Conant had done a meta-analysis of soil carbon changes from grazing management and he's able to show across America that there were uh, rates of a ton of carbon sequestered in soils as a result of changes in grazing management. So getting away from overgrazing, doing rotational grazing, different, different things like that showed that a, a metric ton of carbon per hectare could be sequestered over 20 years. When Dr. Silver looked at that number and looked at the total in California, if we, if we considered increasing soil carbon at that rate on half of California's rangeland, assuming the rest of it wasn't suitable or available, that 42 million metric tons of carbon sequestered is equal to the entire emission footprint of the California commercial and residential emissions. This became important to her. She said, this is actually now scientifically interesting. These are big numbers. So she looked at the global system, and it turns out that Grazed rangeland systems are the single largest cover type on earth. They occur where there's not adequate water to support a forest system. And hopefully as, as you're seeing in Oregon right now with the 1.1 the million dead standing trees, as that system shifts, hopefully we could actually establish rangeland systems there rather than deserts. And so the idea here is that globally, Grazed rangeland systems are huge. They're the single largest terrestrial system. And if we could start managing for soil carbon sequestration on such a large system, potentially we could actually directly impact the climate. That was our thinking. So we organized a, um, a new thing called the Marine Carbon Project. This was in 2008. And we brought together all of the agricultural agencies, organizations, and institutions in Marin. And we, we um, attracted the attention of some local land managers and farmers and, and uh, ranchers. And we all gathered and organized um, how we would go about looking at this question of what role carbon plays in our productive soil systems in our region. And so the first thing that Dr. Silver wanted to do was not look at any one ranch, but actually get a survey to understand what carbon levels were typical in this region. So we got access to 35 dairies and beef operations across the county, where we then conducted a soil survey. And to date, this is still the largest regional soil survey on earth at depth. We went to a meter deep, we dug bulk density pits, we did soil profiling, and then the uh, biogeochemistry team at UC Berkeley took the samples and pulled out all of the organic material, the root tissues, and using soil carbon fractionation chemistry, we were able to identify in those uh, systems the range of carbon types. And this is the more occluded fraction. These are the occluded light fraction and heavy fraction carbon, not the labile. And we found on those sites that there was quite a range of carbon levels from 30 up to 130 tons of carbon per hectare. 
So when we looked at the California average, it turns out Marin County soils are actually typical to kind of fall right in the middle of what California carbon levels were from the literature. So our 2008 soil survey showed we had a range of durable soil carbon from 30 to 150 tons of carbon per hectare. This is a big spread. And Dr. Silver wanted to know um, what the difference was in those sites. It turns out the high carbon sites had all had wet dairy manure applied on. We know that the wet dairy manure application causes a tremendous methane emission and wasn't necessarily good for the climate, but this was the first time we'd ever looked at the long-term impact of a topical application. These are not tilled, but just simply spreading an organic amendment on top of the soil resulted in increases of soil carbon at depth. This was really interesting scientifically now. So it showed that, that there was a way to do organic amendments. And the difference here is the intensive sites had sprayed manure, the extensive had not. So those were just the, uh, the differences between manured or not manured. And we, well, Dr. Silver in particular was very curious how old this soil carbon was in these high carbon sites. She sent the soil samples to Michigan to have it carbon dated. It turns out that in 1996, there was a nuclear test in the South Pacific that released a carbon isotope, a C14 isotope that was like a thumbprint. It was detectable and measurable. We found massive quantities of this 10 year old carbon a meter deep in Marin County soils in a permanent form. This was a game changer moment. This showed that soil carbon sequestration happened quickly, that it could happen, and that it had happened as a result of an organic amendment. So this was new news to everyone. What we wanted to do was a way to, to do this ourselves. We were, we were trying to design a way to test the processes and mechanisms of this phenomenon. And so we chose compost. We chose compost because we could account for all of the emissions associated with the, the collection, creation, transportation, and application of it, and, and subtract the emission profile of that from the carbon sequestered. And so it was our interest to then test this idea across California. And so we, we wanted to go to the two endpoints of the Mediterranean grassland system. So the coastal prairie, which is my ranch, and up in the Sierras, we found a site, the university-owned university extension system, Sierra Foothill, it's SF Rec. And so we went into both of those systems and we created three blocks of plots where we could test these ideas of, of compost application. We also were testing the yeoman's plow for um, key line design and we combined the plow plus compost. We replicated these test blocks of plots three times on each location. And then prior to any treatment, we went in and did a complete biomass survey. We knew what plants there were, how many of them. And prior to any treatment, we, I, I did, and, and teams of volunteers conducted soil measurement to a meter deep, nine locations per plot. We did infrared gas analyzing of the CO2 emissions twice a week. We measured methane nitrous oxide emissions. We installed sensors measuring moisture and temperature to 30 centimeters in three locations per plot. And we found a local source of compost in Sacramento that we could haul both directions, the Sierras and out to the coast. It was certified organic or OMRI certified organic. And then on December 8th, 2008 on my ranch and December 12th, 2008 in the Sierras, using typical compost equipment, we applied one half inch of compost on both sites on the test plots and then waited for the growth and then began grazing in March. Each of us grazed our systems differently. But what's exciting here is that where we put the compost is where the cows all concentrated. So the cows actually instantly look like a uh, scattered chart here, it shows us that the cows preferred the grasses. And we went back in after the cows were removed to look at the results. And what we found was exciting. The first thing we were able to show was CO2 respiration and greenhouse gas emissions were higher where we put compost. I thought this was a bad thing, but Dr. Silver said, this is exciting because it shows us something's going on in there. Let's take a look. 
We looked at the um, composted and controlled over, this is the first two years of data. This has been 15 years now where we have the same data going on. And so where we put compost, we basically measured 30 to 70% more forage production within five months. And it turns out when we analyzed it, this is a higher quality, uh, qual it's a more nutritious protein. So our, our grass production increased measurably both locations within five months. And in terms of the um, carbon sequestered, the composted sites sequestered significant compost or carbon rather. The important thing here is that the control plots lost carbon. That was something we didn't see coming. And we didn't, we were surprised and it was a game changer. I just wanted to check in. Is there, are there any comments or questions? Um, yeah, John, um, first of all, I just want to mention um, when John gave you that entire list of all the different kinds of data they were gathering, that's really um, unusual that they would gather that much. Is, am I right, John? Yeah, these are thousands of measurements over each year. And because of the volume of data, we were able to see patterns that um, you normally wouldn't be aware of. And the, we, we actually did some initial inquiry and determined that we needed, first of all, our, our plot design needed to be big enough. So we had 25 by 65 meters. And the reason we picked that large of a plot was because that contained a representative sampling of the vegetation. So we could see results that were realistic and how, and how that expressed itself across all the different biomass types. The other thing that we did, though, was we determined that we needed to do nine samples within each of those plots, four different depths down to a meter deep, plus bulk density and all of the other me measurements. This is a huge data set, and we're able to see changes that are significant and patterns over two climates, two, so the, the point of the whole thing was that we were, we were measuring the endpoints. We were looking at the different, different soil types, different climate, different grass types, different management. The only thing that was similar was the compost. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're seeing similar results in both extremes from a single action is exciting. And it, it suggests that we would see the same thing in between them. Yeah, and I think that's what is really important about this giant data set, that it helps people be assured of uh, their ability to transfer this to other areas as well. So I think that what Wendy was doing as part of this was just making incredibly sure that the information that was being gathered would, would validate everything. So that's right. That's right. And so the, the approach that she takes is to only use peer-reviewed published literature and the things we did generate papers that are robust and can be defended and duplicated by anyone else anytime. Yeah. And so just as a side note, um, there are over 25 peer-reviewed published papers now as a result of this effort over the last 15 years. This is a significant scientific body of work. Okay. And so the point here is that no one else has to go in with this rigor and this intensity to do the same inquiry, you can take the results and test the practice and measure outcomes rather than do all the background that we did to establish certainty. Yeah, okay. All and right, so, it's about yeah. 1.36, so okay. I don't know where we are, but that is- <laughs> I have way too much, too much to go off. I'll start <laughs> rolling again here. Okay. So the important thing is that, that measuring through the soil carbon fractionation, we were able to show within five months that we sequestered massive quantities of durable carbon in all forms at all depths. This worked. It was very exciting. This is, this is a big success. So Wendy Silver was wrong. We were able to through, well, she was right in that our grazing management, and that's actually the point of this one here, the grazing only lost carbon. That's what that blue bar represents. So our control plots were grazed with my best savory grazing management. And I have I didn't have resource concerns. I was able to get the right number of animals at the right time to do the right job. And my eyes showed me that it was spectacularly successful. 
the, the vegetation response to my grazing management was beautiful and exciting. And it's why we did this whole research project. But when you got in with soil carbon fractionation chemistry, mass spectroscopy, carbon nitrogen analyzers, and looked at the actual molecules, we were actually losing carbon from the system. This is very expensive to do, and you can't see it with your eyes, but that's the point of this level of science. So where we grazed only, we lost carbon. Where we put compost one time, we sequestered carbon. So it was a big success in that regard. And, what, and it basically was at all depths, and um, both they occluded light fraction and heavy fraction. So this worked. It was very exciting. That data set was then taken to Colorado State University and run over a thousand times on the day set model. And it shows that that phenomenon of, of soil carbon sequestration that we saw the first five months will continue for 30 to, to 100 years. This is really exciting. A single bump of compost one time knocks the system in a new direction and it becomes a self-feeding solar powered atmospheric carbon sequestration forage increasing system from then on. So the model also showed us that that compost that we put out at half an inch worked, but perhaps a quarter inch would work. So the next question of course, is will it work on real ranches? Because th this is always, well, yeah, it worked there, but not on my ranch, right? So we organized, we went out and we would drop to our same exact experiments on three local dairies. And in doing so, we were able to add in a fourth treatment, which was actually raw manure, like they were typically spending at that time or, or spreading. So we have the same thing. We have the soil moisture probes, temperature probes, biomass survey. The important thing here is that in these different dairies who have different grazing managements, um, John Taylor put these cows in this field for two weeks, once a year. Bob Giacomini put his replacement heifers in the field for six months. And the little Frankies kept their replacement heifer herd on the field all 365 days of the year. On my end, I had put 230 cows on three and a half acres for eight hours. So you can start to see the, the, the range of grazing pressures that we experimented with. It didn't matter. It's that they were grazed that's important because the cows eat the weeds and the annuals coming up. So will it scale is the next question. We then organized and with, with foundation funding, we were able to identify three large scale demonstration sites where we put thousands of yards of compost out. And doing this, we were able to actually compare the quarter inch and half inch applications side by side. And we'd actually put in uh, three hectare sized exclusions so that Dr. Chris Potter with NASA could look down from remote sensing and satellite imagery using the NDVI spectrum. And he was able to show that within five months, we saw the same biomass response between quarter inch and half inch. That suggested that we could use quarter inch rather than half, which cut the compost down to half. Then at that time, basically we were contacted and, and we'd been working with all along from the very beginning with state agencies and federal agencies. California at this time, and I can't remember the date, but basically there was a, a new conversation about regulating California as an emission sector. And Karen Ross, the, the lead of the California Department of Food and Agriculture reached out to us and asked us if we could make the case that California could be good, good for the climate and therefore not regulated. So we met and the result of that was working with the NRCS climate scientists, taking their practices that they had now shown 34 of their farm bill funded practices were known to be climate beneficial or climate smart as they call them now. We took that set of practices, contacted the Colorado State University team who were the century model authors, and we collaboratively created a new agricultural user interface into the century model using the NRCS practice list and created the Comet Planner which is a tool that anyone can use in America right now for free to show the potential climate benefit of this suite of farm bill funded practices. And this is what the, the earlier um, entry page, I, I think it's been updated a couple of times since then, but basically this is something you guys could check out. 
And that then inspired us in our local Marin County group to create carbon farm plans. And so we started this process now of working with local landowners and going out into the Marin County agricultural system to um, create carbon farm plans to implement these 34 practices and try and establish climate beneficial agricultural systems in Marin County. So this is a typical carbon farm plan. Um, this has been a lot of the work now of the Marine Carbon Project going forward. And um, then we started working with state agencies, the governor's office and the Air Resources Board, the Water Board, and um, that resulted in the then Governor Brown looking to farm and rangelands, forests and wetlands as carbon storage systems, which then resulted in the, the new vision for California which produced the Healthy Soils Initiative with the Department of Food and Agriculture. So then the budget following that was what made it really actually work. So we now have a program in California called the Healthy Soils Initiative, which is a way for greenhouse gas reduction funds to be distributed to land managers who adopt these climate smart practices as described by the Comet Farm Plan. So, the new thing was to get compost added into that. And so we started working with the Natural Resource Conservation Service on an interim practice standard development. They provided uh, or gained, got us access to 17 sites across the state of California that were of interest to them where we could practice or, or test this idea of compost application on all of the major land resource area types. So in 2017, we went out and we hauled the same compost across the state and applied it on all these different different systems. And the result of that is actually the new practice and RCS practice 336. So farm bill funding is now coming online to help land managers pay for the application of compost on raised rangeland systems. So um, we, I, I wanna do a time check with you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, 1.44, we're at. Okay. So, and two minutes. Um, so, or... Anthony, Anthony, what I want to segue to is um, basically what to do next and where to go forward from here. Um, I know you wanted me to speak to you about the carbon pools and the big picture. You can skip that. Go ahead. Do what okay. you want to do. Okay. So, so, here we have now. So we've gotten a new practice of compost application. We've, we've established that soil systems can be managed for carbon and that when you do manage for carbon, the system itself starts to manage for carbon. You get increased forage production, increased water holding capacity. It goes on and on from there. It's a good thing. So we have policy support. We've got, uh, we've done proof of concept demonstration at scale. We're in the, the realm now of national adoption. And so there's a big gap here. Is there enough compost? How do we get um, urban sectors to start managing their green waste streams so that they can make more and more compost to go back onto food production systems? And in some regards, we could start thinking of this as what are we feeding our food? And so, that's my way of connecting our next presenter, Anthony Mint, who's with the Zero Food Print Network. And Anthony, I'm hoping you're on, on this call. Is there uh, a way I, to bring him in? Yeah, I am on this call. Ah, uh, if you can hear me. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you're up for it, I can, if you want to stop screen share, I can do a screen share. Oh, sure. Right. How do I do that? Just, is that a, um, boom. There you are. Hi. Cool. Hi, everybody. Um, and yeah, a few familiar faces. Good to see you, Patrick. Um, so I should say our work is very strongly uh, influenced and inspired by a lot of the foundational research and framework creation that um, John and others in his network have been engaged in. Um, you know, so in many cases, in many ways, it's basically like standing on the shoulders of giants and just sort of like moving things along as much as possible. Um, John is also on our board. Uh, my background is as a chef restaurateur, and I first met John in that capacity. And essentially, we were trying to 
buy beef from the ranches that he was uh, doing this research on and overseeing this research on and kind of telling the story and getting consumers excited about it, et cetera. After a while, we started to realize that it wasn't really making a big enough difference and changing, you know, getting the next practice onto the next acre, so to speak, getting compost onto the next acre in the case of John's work. Um, and so we began a program in collaboration with the California Air Resources Board and Department of Food and Ag to make that possible at scale. Uh, if somebody can enable screen sharing for me, then I could um, kind of get into a few of the nuts and bolts on that. <clears throat> Uh, but, you know, based on what John was saying, the quarter inch application of compost, let's say, um, as per like the second level of discovery, you know, that might cost $600 an acre, $1,000 an acre, you know, so for a rangeland manager, that would be just cost prohibitive to say the least, you know, the, the current food economy wouldn't support that. Um, and so I think what we are doing is trying to create essentially um, a program through collective action that would support it. Um, and so when we began the program, you know, part of what got me to almost like shift my whole career and work on this full time and really get optimistic about the opportunity was this idea of collective action. Um, and so there's some frameworks in other industries like renewable energy that are enabling transformative change. And so I think one of the goals is to sort of apply that kind of framework to agriculture. And so that's quite a lot different from simply trying to get consumers to pay more for the climate smart beef or something. Um, I applaud those efforts. You know, we sort of went all in with our life savings on that work. Um, but you also can see some broader proof points in society like organic as one example, where there are very clear premiums for organic and it's 1% of acres after 50 years. And so if, you know, climate existence, everything is at stake, our theory of change is essentially that you have to go a lot quicker and we can do that through collective action. Um, and so in renewable energy, there's a framework called CCA, Community Choice Aggregation. And the simple version of that is basically that you're improving the grid. So you could start to imagine a dollar per month on the energy bill <laughs> going to the local green energy program. Eventually it becomes an opt out. You don't need a vote. You don't need a ballot measure. Um, it could start to be $2, $5. And then you start to have transformative change going on. You know, a whole city, even a big city, can commit to 100% renewable energy, even though there's federal subsidies for fossil fuels and Shell and Exxon and drilling. And so I think the logic here, getting back to carbon farming, is can we start to get a dollar per month on the trash bill? Can we start to get a 1% from different sectors of the food economy? You know, whether it's producers chipping in, processors, brands, distributors, retail, you know, the consumer, waste management. So every level of the value chain. Federal, government, uh, federal grants, state grants, local grants, um, philanthropy, all of these funding sources could combine to get that $1,000 per acre, to get that compost onto the next acre. Um, and again, I point to Patrick, but, and then there's a bunch of other leading research around fungal dominant compost and all these other advances that are just waiting in the wings. Um, and so you can start to see some of this in climate action plans, like in Sonoma's, uh, where, you know, build up the economic capacity for a sequester local program, implementation partners, zero food print, Recology is the trash company. And so again, just mirroring some of those frameworks from renewable energy, and then starting to apply that to the transition on land. Um, in a single county like Sonoma, that could generate up to something like $45 million a year. And so Sonoma is unique because it's the home of the Carbon Cycle Institute. So they've already done a scoping plan for the county. Um, you know, and you can see here, a goal would be 250,000 acres. So as you imagine, like, geez, where does all the money come from for 250,000 acres of compost application and silver, silver pasture and hedgerows and all these things? Well, if you started to have $45 million a year, you could probably do it in like five or 10 years. So once that kind of collective action is like unlocked, you know, radical transformative change is possible. Um, so Zero Footprint is doing this in kind of a simple crowdfunding way where we're getting businesses to opt in and then that can ladder up into local opt-in programs that can eventually turn into opt-out programs. Um, so we have ordinances already drafted, you know, we're making as much progress as quickly as we can, uh, but it's almost a whole new concept in the world in a way that you that a consumer could directly fund a transition of agricultural practices is kind of new. People are used to like maybe the option of paying more for a good ingredient, but almost nobody that I know has ever had the option to like 
paid to help a farmer apply compost, paid to help a farmer plant cover crops. That's new. Um, on the farm side, our grants are going out to, you know, it could be someone in John's research network with a full carbon farm plan, and, you know, they're doing their fourth, fourth or fifth practice with the funds, uh, or it could just be a conventional producer taking their first step. Um, and then, you know, we collaborate with local government, state government, different things to try to make it part of a new normal. And I think seeing it on the Subway sandwiches receipt um, from our pilot in Boulder, Colorado at five locations for the past year helps underscore just how plausible that is. You know, it's almost like um, if you're in California or Oregon, maybe you're used to paying like five cents for the recycling on a bottle of wine or a can of beer, the container redemption value program. And so that sort of collective action in states like Iowa helped increase recycling from 26% to 86%. So in a lot of ways, what we're saying is it's time to start internalizing some of the costs, make healthy soil and this transition just part of the economy, part of every single transaction. It doesn't need to be begging a few consumers to pay three times as much or this or that. It can just be a couple cents from every purchase, et cetera. Um, and so as John said, you know, Comet Planner is the basis of the guidance for the deployment of this capital. Lots of good things about Comet. It's also very early in a lot of the modeling. And so, you know, there's a lot of yaks in Comet that could be um, addressed, like compost isn't even uh, modeled nationwide yet in Comet. And so many different things, uh, but it's at least a start. And so it's what we use, and then we're actively layering in additional guidance whether it's from the Car Carbon Cycle Institute or in relation to fungal dominant compost or biochar or you know the next and the next thing that we can try to add and start deploying grants based on. Um, and then basically the way the grants go out is essentially sort of like one big reverse auction. So we're paying for the technical assistance provision and then we're inviting farmers to um, propose a scope of work and then to uh, basically request whatever funds they need to complete the project linked to that scope of work. <clears throat> so in this top line example, the farmer's requesting $14,000 for the practices. UCA and R is requesting $2,000 for their technical assistance provision. And then we're taking that total cost of 16,000 and then dividing it by the estimated carbon sequestration from Comet. And so this number on the right is sort of like a modeled estimate of the cost for each ton of carbon removal. So we sort it by all that, and then we're giving bonuses to underserved producers. Um, so far, BIPOC producers have received over 30% of the grant funds. There's a little bit more nuance to it, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll just skip ahead and just say that we you know, basically start deploying grants from the top to the bottom of the queue. And then this can be the on-ramp for you know, a given city or county government to start a carbon sequestration program without hire, hiring a whole staff or like devising everything. They can basically just request $50,000 in their you know, 2023 budget and then start popping it into the projects in that county. Or they could start asking the trash company, you know, hey, would you add a dollar per month on the trash bill for this new local carbon sequestration program? Or creating that kind of consumer circular economy, regenerative economy program that the subway was part of in Boulder. Um, um, and so, so far we've got like I, 75 I businesses <clears throat> participating. And I'll stop I hate to interrupt, but we've got like five minutes left. So I just, maybe you could give us like your last bit and then we can have John come back and say his last little bit. So just to kind of wrap it up. Cool, perfect. Um, I mean, my last bit is that there's major policy shifts going on in terms of organic matter diversion and compost. But even as compost is created, there's no provisions for agriculturally suitable quality or the cost of freight and transportation to get the compost to farms and ranches. And so it really starts to become a thing where every level of the food economy can start teaming up to complete these projects and basically teaming up with farms and ranches and land managers to make this change happen. Excellent. Thank you. So for me, the wrap up would be simple. Um, 2007, it was believed that you could not increase soil carbon. That was the conventional wisdom. 15 years later, roughly, um, we now know that you can increase durable soil carbon. And once you do, it, the system itself starts doing it on its own. We know that on the single largest terrestrial system on earth, if we did enough land, we could actually lower Earth's temperature. And I can say that with confidence because the modeling team at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab took our data and worked with Wendy Silver and her scientists 
And they did the integrated earth systems modeling paper that shows we can actually lower earth's temperature now with what we know. These are very exciting stories. And the question is, where, what's the entry point for everyone? And, and that's kind of the moment right now as we're looking around and looking out and thinking, well, who's doing what where and how can we invite them into this space? And on that note, I would invite the group to engage in a conversation. Okay. Woody, um, you're in charge now. Okay. Hey, well, uh, Angela, you can put that screen on. Uh, we're going to switch over to uh, the at the bar part of the session. Uh, John and Anthony just uh, had uh, summed up a little bit of what they were doing because there's a lot of stuff going on right there. Kathy will lead this. And uh, at this point, what you can do is put your mics on and talk and also look down on your screen. You'll see a, a thing called reactions. You can click on the raise hand part of that and that'll make that's actually easier for for Kathy to see that you want to talk and so you, see that? you can you can do that and then we get called on and this is a general conversation John and Anthony is not just question and answer so there's, there's I know that there are people on who've done a lot of composting on pastures yeah. so there you go it's Kathy a, yeah. you're all yours Okay, um, I think one of the questions that I saw when I went back here, we'll just start here until people raise their hands because I haven't seen any raised hands yet. Um, somebody wanted to know, I'm going back through the chat. Um, I don't see anything. I can just. How much a half inch of compost is in tons and then what the cost might be for that kind of thing. Okay, so. Compost weighs 500 pounds per cubic yard. Um, I'm sorry, I should I should actually have all these numbers down. The, um, backing up a quick click, we picked one half inch application purely as a scientific idea. We were not thinking of compost as an agronomic treatment. We were looking for a stable carbon nitrogen molecule that we thought we could follow in the soil system. So it was Dr. Creek's suggestion that we put one half inch thickness down because we wouldn't cover the growth crowns of the grass plants that way. So half inch was completely a scientific inquiry. Then the modeling showed us that a quarter inch would work. So that's actually the number we should probably talk about. And so um, I, I'm, I'm at a loss here. If we, we put... Um, uh, Zero Foodprint has done dozens of projects at the quarter inch level with okay. resource conservation districts, and it's about 15 tons per acre. Thank you. Thank you. But but important here, you guys, and this is really important, anyone, anywhere, anytime can make compost on site. This was one of the early ideas that Dr. Creek had is if we can if we can get if we can make the case and show that every water should shed should have a compost project going on in it. Then the source of compost is right there within your community and your biomass management makes sense. And I started making compost on our own ranch and all of a sudden my weed seed problems, I was composting everything and it worked. We destroyed weed seeds. And so you don't have to necessarily buy the compost if you're in a position to make your own to start with. But then on the far end of it, Large production compost is available regionally. It can be trucked. And our life cycle assessment showed that you could actually haul compost to Washington, D.C. and back to California and still come out ahead in terms of the emissions. My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was excited too. <laughs> but that's a published, that's a peer-reviewed published paper. Marcia Delange did that work. And it's on the, the link that I keep giving people and I'll, I'll put it in one more time. Um, if you go to On Pasture at that link there in the chat, um, you'll be able to see these. Right on, right? Mm -hmm. And then John, you have your hand up. Would you like to talk? Me? No, John, uh, yeah. John Marble, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, <excited. laughs> you have to unmute though, John. You're unmuted. Okay. Unmute. Um, yes, thank you for, for the uh, chat today. Um, I'm thinking it sounds like you had extraordinary cooperation um, 
regionally, I guess I'd say, um, not just the university, but the, the farm community. And I'm, I'm surprised. Um, I have some experience with what seem like really good ideas that are funded through agencies that have very apparent environmental success. And yet it's that old, um, you have to push a good idea down someone's throat before they'll uh, take a hold of it. And I'm, I'm just wondering, how, how did you how did you get so many people to take part? You had dozens of sites. Yeah, this is, um, so my background actually is project management. I studied uh, construction project management at, at San Francisco State University. Stakeholder engagement is the is right at the top of that process. And you, you have a, um, a lot of work to do to actually meet people where they are and establish a coalition of the willing based on a shared vision. So there was a tremendous amount of groundwork. We actually received a $70,000 grant from the Marin Community Foundation to hire a developmental specialist to come in and interface with all of us in this region to create the Marin Carbon Project and establish our vision, mission, strategy, and all of these things. And then we were very receptive to and did public meetings. We went out on the landscape to town halls, interviewed farmers and ranchers. We dropped talking about carbon immediately and started talking about forage because they didn't care about carbon <laughs> until we started seeing results. And now <laughs> we started coming forward going, now about this carbon I've been sequestering, how do I get money for it? But it's, it's, a, it's an engagement and it's an ongoing conversation. And it takes a lot of work up front. And let's see, um, Woody, you have your hand up. Well, yeah, I do I, actually because I see I see Terry and Pete are on, and I know that on their ranch on the Oregon coast they've been adding compost. I'd like to hear a little bit about how that's relating to what John has done because you've done basically the same thing without the measurements. Um, yeah, I I have a. a it might possibly enhance the composting that's going on with um, with w where you can compost and where you can't compost because it's not you know, like on steep hillsides or something. What we've seen is composting or uh, synthetically fertilizing. If animals eat that more, like you were saying in your presentation, they uh, they tend to eat it better and then they would uh, drop their droppings there and that would become more fertile and the other gets less and less. And so we've, with our rotational grazing, we let them eat places and we just box them down. And so basically it's compost being transferred by the animals, which they're doing all the time. But this way you force them to stay in lower areas where you can get them food and, you know, the water with them with electric fences. And then you can really enhance your ranch, the whole ranch, you aren't just not composting a little spot, you're composting the whole ranch if you can do it in such a way. And so we've blocked off the riparian areas as much as we possibly could. We get water to them and move the minerals with them, but we move them every day. And so there's no part of the ranch that isn't getting composted all the time. And even the steep parts, they may not get it as much, but they're getting more than they would have the other way. So it, it seems, if you do look at bedding grounds, you see a lot of, you know, heavy nutrients there and pretty soon the feed looks really good there and it looks worse off on the other places. So that was kind of our thinking behind that. Shove them to the places you can't get to. Compost easier areas. Yeah. <clears throat> and then use that impact on the rest of it. So I need to, I need to talk about the difference between manure and compost. They are radically different. Compost actually is a source of greenhouse gas emissions. Well, I'm manure. sorry, manure is manure, manure, right? And so one of our papers was a study of, of the dairy la manure lagoons and the emissions associated, the methane coming off of them. Compost is different than fertilizer. It's different than mulch. It's different than manure. Compost is the result of a living process, microbes, combining the carbon and nitrogen, air, and moisture to create a stable molecule. And your compost pile can actually become a massive source of methane if it goes anaerobic. So it's 
critically important in this managed environment to take your manure, green waste, keep it moist, keep it aerated, and let microbes convert that manure into this stable carbon nitrogen molecule, which has a pH of 6.5 to 7.4. It has a carbon nitrogen ratio of 1 to 10 or 1 to 19, somewhere in that range. It's wholly different than manure. The field deposition of manure is a wonderful, good strategy. I do it myself. I try and get a manure pat every three feet, which I successfully do. But that's not sequestering carbon. That's what we measured. Where we did that and only that, we were losing soil carbon. The same exact practice on top of a single application of compost one time has continued to sequester massive amounts of atmospheric carbon in forms you can't see with your eye. So the whole project was started by our observation that my grazing management and field deposition of manures was working. And it turned out it was, except that it was costing me fossil carbon below the ground. I think we're seeing something different up here mm -hmm. as a result of the, the start out, the, the base amount of carbon in the soil. Good point. We're looking at a, at a 15 to 20% organic matter in the soil when oh, we're yeah, starting. Yeah. yeah, it would be a waste of time to put compost on that. Unless you could get that carbon sequestering going on at a deeper depth. We're seeing root growth at three feet now, yeah. where we it used to be a six inch matter. Yeah. So if, if you're getting aggregated soil that's going down to 18 inches deep, where it used to go only six inches deep, I contend that there's, or I suspect that there's a substantial amount of carbon sequestering between the six and 18 inch level. I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I apologize. I shouldn't I shouldn't have assumed that you had degraded soils like I did. My, my carbon levels are less than 1% when I started, my soil sort of organic matter rather. So ours is a beat out system. You sound like you're in a really good position with carbon rich soils to start with. I, I think the soils start out different. I think that our active carbon or the labile carbon was at a considerably lesser level than mm -hmm. it is now. Mm -hmm. And that gave us feed production or grass production levels that would have been, would have been indicative of nutrient-free soils. Yeah. Basically, the same nutrient levels as what you were dealing with that were available. And we're, we have a low pH, so that tied more of it up. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're seeing with this, uh, this composting where you can get to on the hill ground and then using sheep on that and, and moving it downhill into the areas you can't, or the steeper areas. I, th I, think, we're, I think we're seeing results that are in line with, uh, um, there's a, I've heard of a, a 30 year Chinese study that said that if you have animal impact, you can increase the carbon levels. Mm -hmm even using commercial fertilizers instead of just using organic fertilizers. Understood. So with that and the soil conditions that we're looking at, I, I think we're seeing some differences here. I bet you are. I bet you it's, are. That's amazing. It's, it's shocking to me. Yeah, it's good for you. <laughs> totally. And, and we are using a fair amount of compost. We, right. we generate between 1,500 and 2,000 ton a year. Oh, you do? So are so, you doing thermophilic bacteria? Yes. It gets hot? Yes, oh. it, it's, it takes two to three days to get to 150 degrees. Good, good. And, if you, and once it gets to heat, then we, turn it, we try to turn it every two to three days. Oftentimes we don't get it done, but. Excellent. Well, you guys are rocking and rolling. Um, I've, I've seen Mike Roberts with his hand up uh, for a while, so I'm going to have him unmute and ask his question. Go ahead, Mike. Can you unmute? I don't know. I pressed the button to say unmute. Mike, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Sorry about that. I was trying to unmute. That's right. There Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'd just like to ask John, um, um, the increase in carbon and, and, and grass, is that 
due to the the, the fungi and bacteria in the in the in the compost? Is it is that is that the reason why you're getting such a uh, yeah sequestering so much carbon? I would say yes to start with. It's a it's a kickstarter, and um, my understanding from Dr. Creek is that the difference between compost and compost tea is that the compost contains those bacteria and, and beneficial organisms. The compost tea contains those, but compost contains those plus the substrate that they require in order to expand their populations. And so putting compost on the soil with the fungus and the microbes jumpstarts the system, but then the system itself from then on takes over from there. So that's why a single application worked. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, sort of. Yes, because the, 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 other, the, other, the other part of the question is, is what, where, where does your compost derive from? Is it, is it from wood chip? Is it from, from cattle houses? Is it from garden waste? So we've um, experimented with everything from green waste from the urban sector, pure green waste. We've done cow manure, goat manure, horse manure. We've done human manure compost. And so the important thing that I've come to understand is anything that was ever alive can be composted. And they take different strategies depending on what it is. Eucalyptus is tough, but it can be done. Anything that was ever alive can be composted. And once you do go through the complete thermophilic bacteria composting and then let it mature during which the fungus comes back in and beneficial organisms come back in, you end up with a very similar molecule. It may have different minerals in it, depending on the feedstocks, but basically all compost, if managed conventionally, results in a very similar molecule. So you haven't found any, any one which is better than, than another? I, you know, that would be a, a, a question specific to what you're trying to grow. So if you have a plant that needs manganese or sulfur or something, and you make your compost biased towards that, um, <clears throat> that would be a smart move, right? Our local yeah. compost folks are very knowledgeable about the different types. So if you go to the bins side by side at our compost yard a mile from here, there are blends that they've put together for different types of row crops or house plants or rangeland. Our rangeland compost we biased it towards woody, more carbon. And um, that Jeff Creek was thinking that that would then be a slow release. It would break down over time. You don't want that in your row crops. So they tailor the compost locally for the use. Right, yeah. But the, the woodier compost would take more nitrogen to break down, I take it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, you've spoken to me about the fact that when you're growing compost locally, it gets all the um, bacteria and the things that you really need. And yeah. can you mention that to folks? Yeah. So this is so in our our local dairy, the Lafranchi Dairy, which was one of our earlier sites, they were the a recipient of a California Healthy Soils Alternative Manure Management Program grant to convert from lagoon to dry scrape and compost. And so the, the gentleman in charge of that, Will Box, who, who unfortunately passed last year, was an expert. He's a soil scientist. And um, it was very important to him that the compost produced there would then go mature out on site, if possible, where you were going to apply it. Because during that time, the, the local population of organisms would come into the pile and populate it. And then it would become of that system, if you will. Okay. Um, Woody, as Woody, you have your hand up. Would you like to talk? Uh, just a moment. Uh, it's just a, mm -hmm. I, I was just at a, a conference up in the Northeast United States um, where it has uh, not just different soils, but has winters, <laughs> unlike part, mm -hmm. part California and has frozen ground uh, and those are mostly in those areas like in New York State and other places. Have, the main issue there was the difference between compost and manure because they're, they're very concerned about spreading manure uh, on the land, particularly when it's frozen ground, 
of the loss of nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And that was is part of their models to reduce greenhouse gases, et cetera, et cetera, was the nitrous oxide release from manure. And I suspect that compost doesn't have that because the nitrogen is captured in completely different molecules and is mm -hmm. much more stable as opposed to what manure, which it's not captured like that and therefore can become a gas. And that was a very, you know, we're in, in, in the West Coast, we don't have frozen ground the way half the country or more does, but spreading manure on frozen ground apparently releases quite a bit of night. Uh, that's a concern. That's a major concern that we've kind of kind of ignored, but in our area, but not in other parts of the country. Good point. Okay. And Mike is back with another question. So we'll, Mike, would you <coughs> go ahead? Um, yeah, we, we've, um, we're, we're over in England, we are, and um, we use, um, we use green waste compost for bedding our cattle on. So we, we bring it back and we tip it up in our houses and it's up six, seven foot high and the cattle come in in the autumn and um, lie on it and they, they, they do their dung and, and um, urinating and, and we scrape it out and, um, um, and put it on our fields. Now, would that, is that detrimental to the compost when, when cattle would be, would be dunging and urinating on it or would it be beneficial? Um, I I don't think it would be bad. I don't know, but I do know scientists who would know. So right. there are people who could answer that clearly and with, with good data behind them. But um, a, a mature, stable compost, you're, you're basically adding manure and urine to it. But the volume, it sounds like, if you have six foot thick bed of compost, um, does it actually get saturated with urine or is it absorbed into um, it? No, no. <clears throat> we go in every every couple of weeks and scrape it off with a with a, like a excavator. And mm -hmm. um, and you'd only be scraping off the, the top four or five inches and it's mm -hmm. it's dry, dry material again afterwards. It's, yeah. it's 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 brought back and it's left to dry out over um, over a three month period. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it comes out dry. But yeah, we, we've had analysis and and yeah, all the P's K's um, uh, and nitrogen is, is all all, uh, all higher and better than our, our other farmyard manure and the original compost. Um, but I, I don't know whether it be, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't found out what bacteria or fungi effect it has had on it yet. Mm -hmm. But um, the, So but, one thing I've, I've learned is when there are unpleasant odors associated with anything you're doing, then you might want to look at it and change it because... Correct. Odors are the indicator that things are going anaerobic or doing right. something you yeah. don't desire. Okay. Yeah. No odors. So that's, that's a good, that's I a good point. But I probably, you're probably good. Yeah. I know. I just like to say thank you. It's, it's really interesting. You know, I'm, I'm on the other side of the planet from yourselves, but it's really interesting um, to have this conversation and, um, and, and have, have the knowledge and, and uh, uh, yeah, a lot of respect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric Hall, you have your hand up. Go ahead and unmute. Eric, are you there? I'm oh. coming. Thank Here. you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Too many buttons to push here. Yeah. Um, so um, my question, uh, John, is I took a course on, um, well, um, uh, an ex I think it was an extension course, couple of uh, uh, three weekends um, through Oregon State University on composting. And um, uh, I have to tell you that after going through all of that process, I sort of was left with the sense that um, you combine <laughs> some ingredients, uh, you, you stir it occasionally, and um, something good's come, going to come out of the end. And um, I guess my, uh, um, uh, um, so I, I have been sort of fumbling around on my own uh, farm with regard to those efforts. And uh, um, I find myself, um, learning more here today and um and and uh wishing for a um an, an approachable text or youtube video or some such that um could um I expand on my own knowledge with regard to composting practices um and so i guess um i'm asking for uh what's your favorite or recommended text well, so I, my first thought for you would be to look to the U.S. Compost Council. Okay. Um, that group is really committed to this art. And, um, but if you have a local 
educational institution teaching composting are is there are can you go back to them um when you say text you mean something to read uh, yeah something to read something to watch something to um uh um i i guess sort of uh self-affirm as well mm -hmm. as um 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 because your point's spot on it really is sort of an art you're 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 cooking without sort of um, uh, w without a spoon in hand that you can put mm -hmm. into your mouth to taste, right? Mm -hmm. So you're relying on new things like your nose and uh, and and such. And there's there's stuff that's happening that it's kind of hard to tell, you know, um, uh, um, specifically um, whether what's supposed to be happening is happening. And so that's I guess that's. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, where I'm not really sure if what I'm going through and generating is as um, uh, is developing as good a product as I might, um, and and so that's where the source of uh, I guess something to build uh, confirmation. Yeah, understood. It's nice to have confidence in things you're doing, <laughs> isn't it? So I when I first started, I made some horrible glop. I absolutely okay. messed up. Repeatedly, and because I was working at the wrong scale, I kept thinking I could get away with a small pile. It, you know, there are some fundamentals. You need a minimum of a cubic yard, but that's too that's almost too small in order for the thermophilic bacteria to get up to heat to do their job. And then I had so we we got very deep into making the compost here. We used uh, the corn stover. We did this whole research project on our ranch with the scientists making our own C3 grass-based compost. And I had to learn how to do it. So I had to get instruments. So I had to get the moisture probe. I get the temperature probes. And, um, you know, I was working with the scientists who regularly monitored things and told me when to turn the pile and keep it aerated and so on. Um, so you can use instruments, but ultimately you get a sense of it. And that you're in a learning curve moment where you're you're going to replace measurement with just senses, right? Ultimately, right. Will Box and I, I really miss him, but he had decades of experience, and he could take a handful of compost and squeeze it. And he had six different hand gestures where he would make a ribbon out of it. He would squeeze it and he and i recorded him and I, I could look this up but he basically could tell you everything about that compost by its smell its temperature it's how much moisture squeezed out if it made a ribbon all these things he would and he, he had gotten it down to his tactile senses right after years and years <laughs> of production he was an artist right so um but he didn't do that at first he made mistakes. He he used instruments to inform him, and so on. So, boy, don't lose your courage. Stay the course. <laughs> okay, thank you. Appreciate that. And we can have one last question, I think, because it's two twenty-five. And there's Andrew Dykstra has a question. He's got his hand up. Can you unmute? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So we've been doing compost since like the nineteen eighties. Uh, for the organic rules, they're all started at our farm with Miles McAvoy. But uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, you got to make money at this farming deal too, huh? Um, yeah. <laughs> so our compost is about 3% nitrogen. So I'm kind of curious as to why you want to put a half inch on there. Because that if you do an eighth of an inch, which is about six yards to the acre, there should be about um, two, 200 pounds of nitrogen. In one year. Now, granted, what I'm looking at is our soils are probably different because we're around 8% organic matter and it's, uh, you know, river valley. So, yeah, and then there's a difference between manure and compost. There's a big difference. You got to follow the rules. And then you also get a different product. But half inch of compost, well, um, why would you do that? Because I, I was doing science. I was not doing it as a land manager. I used a half inch for the science. We were not trying to show the benefit of compost. We were trying to follow a carbon molecule in a form that was stable. So the half inch was purely for science. It's not something I'm suggesting anyone do. 
a quarter inch in our region was really significant. But we don't have nearly the baseline carbon levels you do. And you probably have more rain than we do too, I'm guessing. I'm curious, what is your what do you produce? Is it grass or are you row crop or what do you do? Uh, it's mostly grasses. Yeah. Grass. So you're a grass system. Do you hay it or do you graze it? Hay and pasture. Haying. Okay. So you're going to have to replace stuff that's removed through the haying operation. So your needs would be different than someone who's just putting animals out in that field. Um, but I, I would not suggest half inch and I would actually be challenged to, to justify any compost if you have that high uh, existing carbon levels in your soil. And the nitrogen in the in the, the the stability of the nitrogen in the compost is wholly different than that in fertilizers and manures. Mm -hmm. It's a much more stable form that doesn't leach and doesn't off gas. So now this year we just started also separating our man liquid manure. Mm -hmm. So that heats, but that's not really that's not the same as compost. It doesn't smell no. either. Not the same. And then the liquid, you know, we get a lot of rain and you have to capture all of that to, to protect the fish. Okay. And then we pump the liquids out. Yeah, yours is an entirely different system that I'm actually not at all knowledgeable about. You know, our, our problem down here is dry. Um, you know, we're not arid, but we, we have a fraction of your rainfall and we have heavily degraded soils that are, are compacted and have lost most of their carbon are, are dominated by annuals from Europe. But we can go, we can easily go three months with, with no rain in the summer, mm -hmm. which is what really what counts. In the summer, in the winter time, you can get 48 inches of rain, wow. it all washes away. But- well, Could you send some down here? <laughs> nah, no, we're sending <laughs> 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 all right wash, well, fertilizer can wash away if you're not careful too yeah but the compost so just a, a finishing note on that in california caltrans our highway department specifies compost on slopes to stop erosion mm -hmm. so the treatment that's required by law is compost on steep slopes because it's stable and it doesn't leach it doesn't run off and it promotes root growth, which then stabilizes the soil. Our initial experiments on my ranch and in the Sierras were on 30% slopes. We did that on purpose to show that we could get equipment up there and that the compost wouldn't leach off and that it worked. And, it, and those were all successes. All right, um, John, I think we've done it. It's 2.30. Wow. Uh, Woody, is there anything else that we should be doing? Um, nope. to close off the session? Well, well we, we are. I, I want to recognize Anthony Mint and just, it, he is in Oregon. And that was the point of inviting him. He's a local um, connection point, I would suggest, to close the cycle between the urban sector, those who benefit from your good hard work, so that they can start helping you feed your food. Yeah, and I think that's something that I wanted to add is at the end as well, which is this whole idea, if we can get the urban people involved in composting and providing their waste, it's like we're closing the circle and we're finally saying to, um, you know, with all the time that we've been worried about, do the people know what we're doing? Do the farmers, do they understand their farmers? This is a way for them to participate. And it's an important way. It's better than recycling glass and plastic. Um, it's a way of feeding themselves. And I think that's really critically important. So that's probably the next step to this. So, so thank you, John and Woody. Can, do you want to, John, do you have anything else? Well, just is there anyone out there with a burning question that they're not going to sleep tonight because they didn't get to ask it? No, nope. I think they're done. Good. <laughs> I, 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 did Terry, were you trying to talk there? Yeah, just one little question is how is with your uh, incentivizing the carbon in the sequestration in the soil, uh, what do you do if you have something like high carbon rates right now, or you know, organic matter so high carbon? Is is there anything 
you can't do much better than 15 or 20 percent. So <laughs> does that bunch get left out if you've done something right to get to that or? No, early adopters, um, that's a conversation to be had. But there's also a whole range of emission avoidance um, practices that have monetary benefits to them. So if you convert, I don't know what, what your situation is, but I know there are engine conversion programs, there's um, riparian systems, wind brakes. So the, look at the Comet Planner and look through that list and there may be funding streams available for these other practices that avoid emissions or um, in creeks, we measured massive amounts of carbon where trees were planted. And so, you know, there's there are other, our whole entry point was grazed rangeland systems in degraded soils because globally, that single system alone, if managed for carbon, could lower Earth's temperature. So for me, that's the floor. That's where my whole focus is. Because if we lower Earth's temperature, we can create reliable climate patterns, which give us predictable weather so that we can perform agriculture. It's kind of fundamental. Yes. Thank, uh, thank you so much. This is yeah. important. It's been fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I'm go ahead, Woody. I'm all right. I'm, I'm, you're in charge. Well, uh, we want to uh, from the uh, Oregon Forage and Grassland Council. Uh, we definitely uh, want to thank uh, John and Anthony for being guests, and Kathy for organizing it on her end. I know they they've all worked pretty hard to make this thing happen. I did occur to me that you know if you if you had a nuclear power plant nearby and you could take the waste from that and add it to compost, you would be able to spread your stuff and know where it is by simply using a Geiger counter. Yeah, or do it at night. You could see it. Yeah, you could see it. That'd be great. <laughs> Any case, uh, well, thank you for a very, very interesting discussion and a lot of good questions in the in the in the uh, uh, at the bar. Uh, this is being brought to you. <laughs> sounds like a radio show. Uh, being brought to you by by the Oregon Forage and Grassland Council. Become a member, and you can see these things and whatever else. And and we are working. We'll be working to put this up. Uh, this particular one, we're gonna we're working to see what we can do to put this in. In a, in a more public uh, venue so people can see it uh it's because this is a very special one and uh uh do tune in uh we'll be looking at putting on more lunch with forages at sometime in the mid midwinter uh this is a volunteer organization so it's not like uh, it kicks in like uh, microsoft it uh people have to just uh you know roll up their sleeves and spend some extra time and be able to do this it's a work of love so uh again uh john and uh, and anthony and kathy thank you very much for being on and uh we'll see you and 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 Aunt angela for also backing up with the with the with the it so uh thank you everybody for being on and uh, we'll see you uh, next year very good thanks all thanks everybody Thank you.